Can we pray together? Father, we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ asking you to touch us right now. We ask you to strengthen us all together and especially this family, Lord Jesus, as we celebrate today the homegoing of Barbara and Petty. As the world looks in, and as we do even at church, we call it a memorial service to take together some of the memories and remember her life. We ask you to touch us today. And also, Lord, most of the family is here, but we ask you to touch her husband of almost 56 years who's in the intensive care unit right now so that you would reach down and touch Rudy and strengthen him in Jesus' name. Lord, even a time like this, Lord, the only thing we know what to do is to quote your scripture. You said in Isaiah 53 and 5 that you were wounded for our transgressions. You were bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon you, and by your stripes we're healed. Touch Rudy, I pray. And now, Lord, I pray like just a bucket of warm, soothing water, let peace begin to come over this sanctuary, this family, and these friends. And, Lord, we're careful to give you praise as we take these next few moments together in Jesus' name. The church said amen. I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been before. No sad goodbye will be spoken for time won't matter
You know, the Bible says to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. We've come here today with this family and host of friends, and thank you for being here today. And these wonderful pastors and our state overseer also to acknowledge Miss Barbara in just a little while. But to honor this life, uh, I was thinking a while ago of scripture to begin this with. You know, in John the 13th chapter, Jesus has just knelt down and he's washed the saints' feet. He's had communion with them, broke bread, fellowship with them. And then he looks around after doing all these servant leadership things and he says, one of you is going to betray me. I'm going to die. Can you imagine how they must have felt for just a moment or two? But then you turn a couple of pages into the 14th chapter of the book of John. And he says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I do, I'll come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Time and time again, the Lord Jesus gives us comforting words. I was asked, as I said a while ago, their dear pastor, Barbara and Rudy's, will bring the word in just a few moments, but as a friend of the family, over 40 years, I think, good times, couple little rocky times, but most of the time, real good. The Lord blessed me to know in this family. When I was a uh, 1982, Tanine and I got married, and we started going to the Malden Church of God right in this area, and, and Miss Barbara was her Sunday school teacher. She was the old-timey Sunday school teacher. She didn't, she used a commentary, but Darlene, she kind of wrote her own commentary, and that lady prayed and prayed, and she was serious about the Lord's business, but I was thinking about a couple times we'd get on her and do things to her I was kind of bishop in and out of church uh, quite a bit in my first year or two of marriage I was at church but I still like to be mischievous and do some things she would call it like sister Dolly Warren used to tell me pastor or Dennis she'd say quit doing that foolish jesting I cut up too much and I've been known to do that at times but I can remember one time uh Back in the day, and she probably cut my hair for 10 or 12 years, I guess it was. And I was telling the family the other night, I got one of those, believe it or not, okay, but I had one of those curly perms, you know, real long in the back. And uh, the first time I got it, boy, she had that thing so close to my head, you couldn't even pick it. And uh, next day, we were all over, I believe, on the campground in Mom's trailer. And I looked at Steve and Darlene, I said, I'm going to pull one on her. I called her, and I said, Barbara. I said, you're not going to believe this. I said, all oh, my hair is gone. Of course, I didn't know I was going to have to deal with that later, okay? This is 40 years ago. She said, oh, my goodness. She said, what? I'd like to get her geared up, you know. She said, what's going on? I said, I don't know. What am I going to do? And then finally, Darlene got on the phone to kind of calm her down a little bit. But that was foolish jesting of Rudy, who is at ICU right now, but as I said a while ago, but uh, you, Rudy always had a way of just, just calming her. You know, she'd get in that high-pitched voice, it, it, very emotional. Rudy, Rudy, Rudy. So me and Steve, uh, this is after they moved out in the country, Steve and I got on their Pasofino horses one day, and we didn't know they were fine-stepping horses. We were young then. We knew one speed on a horse, run wide open. Well, they kept on fussing at us because they didn't want you to get out of that fine stepping gate there. Well, we got them running pretty good. And I believe the horse's name was Malacon. And uh, we got on old Malacon. Boy, that was Rudy's pride and joy. And Steve got him running. Well, he got charged up pretty good. So Miss Barbara Ann was going to show us how to calm him down. So she got on there and started him riding off. And he got across the pasture. And, buddy, he whipped around. She wasn't in no fine step. She was coming across that pasture just like Steve and I was, wide open. All you hear, Rudy, Rudy, Rudy. Rudy had a way about him. He was a man of wisdom. He looked around, looked over him, and I said, I'm sorry, Barbara Ann, I didn't hear you. And then he kind of snickered. 
I, I think he heard her, okay? <laughs> then there was one time I was helping, believe it or not, coach the ladies' softball team at Malden. Miss Barbara Hamby, I saw her back there. That was the day when all of us played some, and, and uh, we, we had Barbara out in center. Had Miss Barbara Ann out in center field for some reason. I don't remember. I was hitting them pop-ups. And boy, boy, Steve, I think you were there catching up for them. Boy, I was hitting them as high as I could. And, and she, she got to going and she was catching them. Hit it higher. Oh, boy, here we go. So I hit one a little bit higher. And she got to going. And, and the glove was in her face. And all of a sudden, she moved the glove to see where the ball was. She found it. <laughs> right in the eye. Steve said, she's going, she's going, she's going, and she went down. But we love these people. They were, they were the first Church of God family that I knew, Bishop, that had a swimming pool that you could swim in. To God be the glory, okay? I better leave that one alone. So we did, we swam in it. But here's what I loved about Barbara and Rudy Pettit. Wherever, whatever was going on, you were always welcome in their house. At that time in our life, we just got married. A couple of years later, we were in Steve and Darlene's uh, wedding, and uh, we were almost inseparable there for long, for for many years. And so, as as we got closer and closer, uh, you know, we began to love them like a mom and dad. I began to confide in Barbara. Matter of fact, Barbara was probably one of the per- first people I told before I ever started preaching 10 or 12 years that I thought I might have the hand of God on me. And she said, well, by all means, whatever you do, you do it for the glory of God. Rudy was always one I could go to also, as I said, a man of wisdom. Uh, matter of fact, I wrote something down. Probably of all the men I've ever met, Rudy Pettit was one of the nicest gentlemen I'd ever been around, and I appreciated him. But there was a time in our life when we were young married that we went through a very tough time, me and Tanine did. And, uh, and, and people around us were saying this and that and the other, and we were trying to work things out within ourselves. And here's what I like. Every day of the week, Miss Barbara, my Sunday school teacher, would call me. I'd say stuff, Barbara, I'm not, com- I'm not coming back to church. I- I'm tired of church. I don't like the way church people do you. She said, come back to church. She would pray for me, and she did that each and every day, probably almost six months. And God took somebody like me and later on and called them to the ministry. That's the way this lady did. She would stand her ground. Whatever, whatever she thought she was right, she would stand her ground there. Here's one thing I... I I do remember her most of all as a minister of the gospel. She, was a, she loved the prison ministry. She loved to tell these people. Her scripture was Luke 4 and 18, setting the captive free, the ones who are bound up to loose them. And I thought about it today. I said, here's what she did. She went in and touched their lives. Their lifestyle she lived or she lived, her lip style, she spoke that. She knew that God was with her everywhere she went. She had a divine message, and the divine message was simply this, that God was always there, never to leave them or forsake them, or go with them even to the end. Excuse me. In her prison ministry, I was telling Bishop Rabin a while ago, our state overseer, he's got some stats he'll read in just a little while in the Church of God. But through the Prison Ministry Fellowship, she preached 1,919 sermons. Can you say amen? Listen to this. Through those sermons that she preached, 1,852 people that were in bondage, that were in in prison, but they weren't imprisoned. 1,852 people gave their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I think you ought to give the Lord a hand clap of praise. See, we guys right up here especially, we know the church of God. But outside the walls there, there is so much more territory. Thank God that he gives us a platform. And she used that platform of the church of God. But she preached the gospel. When you, when you got around, you knew she was Pentecostal real quick. But you didn't care if she was Baptist or Church of God or Methodist. You just knew she was in tune with the Lord. Of those 1,919 sermons that she preached in the prison ministries, 1,831 people were sanctified. A lot of us young folks are still trying to figure out what that was. But she still believed in old-time sanctification. Here's what I loved right in the midst of prison ministry. She preached 1,919 sermons. 1,011 people were filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and she believed in the old-time evidence of speaking with tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Would you just celebrate with her right now all these people that come to the kingdom of God? She had a divine mission, I said. She had a divine mandate. She had a divine mission. And she spoke every step of the way. She lived that. Here's the words, I believe, to the family. And I believe she heard when she got to heaven. Be something like this. Well done, Miss Barbara, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over the little things that I've given you. I opened the prison doors, and you went through them. All over this state, and if she could, the next state to us. And she reached people for the kingdom of God. And she heard those words. Now enter into the joys and the presence of the Lord that God has prepared for those who love and he loves. Can you say amen? He's been good. Can we pray together? Father, thank you today again for your blessings. Thank you today, Lord, because we know to be absent here is to be present with you. And we ask you, Lord Jesus, to minister to this family right now. Touch them, Lord, I pray. Lord, I pray that you would just help them and strengthen them through the remainder of this service and the days and months to come. Lord, I've been a dear friend to them. They've been a dear friend to me. Lord, they've got a great pastor that will come around in just a few moments. But Lord, help us as brothers and sisters also lift them up as we unite together for them in their time of bereavement. Thank you, Lord, for allowing somebody like me to cross her paths. Thank you, Lord, for help, helping her to lead the path and for me to follow. Now bless this family. Strengthen them. Again, touch Rudy in Jesus' name. Amen.
to the family, I offer condolences from the 50,000 Church of God members, 1,000 ministers, and almost 400 churches of the Palmetto State. You are special to us. You have a special place in our heart. We value you. Thank you for sharing your loved one with us so that the kingdom of God might be advanced. The psalmist said the Lord is close to those who are brokenhearted. He rescues those who are crushed. So he knows where you're at and he knows how to meet your need. Now I'm going to share with you a certificate of accomplishment. There was somebody... Uh, a newscaster years ago, he would end his program something like this and now for the rest of the story. You've heard the statistics about those that were saved in ministry and how impressive they are. Amen? I believe that deserves a round of applause right there for a great job. Well done. Now let me share with you what happened inside the church. Inside the church, she preached 74 sermons and 711 people accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Two were sanctified. We don't know exactly what that means, but we believe it. And three received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know how any ministers in the house feel about this, but you give me 711 members, and I tell you, I've got a pretty good church. And she built a great church. They may have been spread out, but she built a great church while here uh, on earth. I, I offer you a word from the uh, book of Genesis. It is the word coffin. It's only found one time in the New King James Version. It is where we get a couple of our words from. One of those is hope chest. That's where a young lady puts something in the hope chest waiting for that special day. Another word we get from it is the treasure chest. That's where you put your treasures in. One day you're going to go get them out, use them, invest them, or whatever. I submit to you what you have in front, us to, uh, in front of us in our mind is the coffin that the Lord has for his children. It is true to be absent in body is to be present with the Lord. But it is also true that one day he's going to come back and get us. And he's going to receive us unto himself. Why? Because we are his treasure. Because we are those valuable things in his hope chest. I submit to you, it won't be long. It won't be long. You'll see her again if you know Jesus. God bless you. Pastor Dennis was talking about the inconvenience of the metal roof. I like it. It always gives me a little longer to speak because nobody's in a hurry to get outside. Um, first of all, I have to say what an honor it is for Barbara, our, our state bishop, being here for her service and all the ministers uh, that are here. Pastor Dennis, I've been, been friends with him a long time. And you being here, what an awesome representation of you being here as well. And I love you, Dennis, but you didn't do it exactly right. Rudy! They told me I had to do, I would do that, and Barbara would get so mad. Rudy, would you bring me some tea? Would you rub my feet? I'd do that, and, and I, I think that was when Barbara would leave the church. She loved Rudy, and Rudy loves her. She loves Rudy, and Rudy loves her. And, of course, everybody that was around them gleaned from their love. And you guys, uh, you've got a great heritage, hardworking, loving the Lord. I thought about all the many things, the hats that Barbara wore, the cowboy hat. She would come over to the house, we'd ride horses, and I remember when they first started, and I'm thinking, okay. But they, we, we, the cowboy hat, the mother hat, the daughter hat, aunt, uh, wife. But I think, Dennis, you, what you said, is, that's what really stood out in my mind of all the hats that she wore. 
my thoughts of Barbara is what a teacher she was. And, and these gentlemen read, they read about her accomplishments as a licensed minister of the Church of God, but that was later on in her life. I remember when, when she got credentialed and we, we petitioned for that and went through that. And, um, but there are years and countless thousands of students that she taught. And the word that she carried, and what came to my mind about 3 o'clock in the morning when I was just kind of contemplating this on Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. He gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, which Barbara was, but some to be pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the service to building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. The one that, things, that, that stands out in my mind so much is how Barbara was a teacher and loved teaching, but she was a, and I think the scripture does this uh, purposely. It says pastors and teachers because she was a teacher, but she pastored her class. Just like Pastor Dennis was talking about her calling and and, uh, and, and I, I, we had the same conversation. I said, I'm not coming back to church. I'm through with church. And she would call me and say, you, you have to come back. You're the pastor. And so, <laughs> we, you know, but we would, we would have those. But she was a pastor teacher. She loved all the people that she taught through all the years. And, and I remember when, when she was talking about coming, um, Jimmy and Marilyn Patterson had been her pastors. They were at Malden. And uh, when I knew she was talking about coming to our church and, and I was going to be compared to them, I got real nervous but, because she loved them and spoke so highly of them. But one thing she said, she just said, Pastor Smith, I just want to teach. I, I hope you have a place for me that I can teach. And, and she did do that for so many years and for so many people. And, uh, but the Bible said in Ephesians 4, God gave some, and I'm so thankful God gave us Barbara Pettit as a teacher because her teaching wasn't just in the prisons. It wasn't just in a church setting like this. It wasn't in just a Sunday school class or a classroom. Her teaching was everywhere in life, and she taught us so many things in life, and um, those who God allowed you the joy of knowing Barbara, you, you know uh, it was interesting, but what a great teacher she was. And as a licensed Church of God minister, uh, she was recognized for ability to teach. But I just want to point out a couple of things. Like I say, she taught in front of the class, but she taught other places at the time. Like one time she taught me was in the ER when it had their bad car wreck. And, and you know, when I was younger, I had problems with, with blood. And I went in, and, and I had to kind of help hold Barbara. And she said, oh, please, Pastor John Smith, don't, don't pass out. I said, and she was more worried about me passing out in the ER than she was herself. But she just, she would, she taught so many things. She taught me to trust the Lord in critical situation. It was a, a bad situation. And, and from there, she taught, uh, taught me some things when uh, Miss Holloway passed away. We would talk on the phone for hours, and she was, she was very hurt and devastated and you know what a hard time she had over that but she taught me how to navigate through storms and how to get through troubles when your faith is shaken to the very core and you have to ask God because sometime later my mother-in-law passed away and and I had faced similar situations and she taught us how to navigate in faith when you couldn't see what God was doing and you weren't sure about what God was doing she she taught us how to raise children because Darlene and her family and Ross and his family love the Lord. And I don't care what you do on this earth. To me, the number one success in life is raising children who love the Lord. That is success. When you get to heaven, they won't ask you how much you made per year. They won't ask you, uh, you know, what your position was. They won't ask you anything. But when you can stand there with your family, you can really say that I've... So she taught us about raising a family that would also love the Lord and work in church and, and give themselves to church. And then they would raise children that love the Lord and, and would do those things too. She taught us 
how to grow older. I was going to say gracefully. <laughs> Barbara wasn't excited about that, but she taught us how to do it and how to get into that place in life where you wonder, is it better to stay or to go? Or you're like Paul, to live is Jesus Christ, but to die would be gain. And she taught us through her life how to work, go through those places. She taught us how to make the next step from this life to the life to come and how to do it as a child of God. So she taught a lot besides just what she taught in prison ministry and just what she taught week after week in the Sunday school class. But again, in thinking about it, I thought about in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, one of my favorite chapters. It ends with verse 13. But now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now faith, hope, and love abide. When you leave this world, there are three things that you're going to leave behind. Faith, hope, and love. When you pass, these three things are going to re remain. Your faith, your hope, and your love. And he said the greatest of these is love. And so I want to quickly look at these. Number one is hope. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13. We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you do not grieve as those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So we know today Barbara taught us or has helped us to have hope. I've done funeral services, and I'm sure you other ministers have too, funeral services where you weren't exactly sure where the person that you were celebrating their life, where they were. I've, I've gone and talked with families who had questions about their, their spiritual state of their loved one. But that's not the case today by any means. Barbara spent a life letting us know that she had hope in Jesus Christ. And so it's such a blessing as a family to know we will see her again. We will be. So she taught us how to have hope. She gave us that privilege of having hope. And so now abides that hope. We can also believe that, that we too can go to heaven and have that hope of eternal life. So the hope that Barbara lived her whole life with, she's passed on to us. And we have that hope today. Her last breath in this world was followed by her first breath in that world. And we have that hope. She, her, her hope of her life has been passed on. Then he said also, not only is it faith, uh, the, the, thing, the thing of hope, but of faith. Barbara's teaching definitely let us know that she had faith. She had faith and she was a prayer warrior. The first time we met was at a prayer meeting. And she had come out to a prayer meeting that we were holding. And, and, and she had faith in God. She believed in prayer. And she trusted the Lord. And here's the thing about faith, and most of you, you know this, I'm sure. Faith is not necessarily the ability to change our circumstances. Faith is believing and trusting God regardless of our circumstances. And I saw Barbara hold on to faith in some tough times and in some wonderful times. I saw Barbara have faith through the good, the bad, and the ugly. I saw her with her faith. So she, her faith is enduring now on this front row, on these front rows. Her faith is outliving her in this world by the faith that she's passed on, not only to her physical family, but to her church family of folks that she's taught in Sunday school classes and taught lessons and all. So we have faith, we have hope, but then we have the love. Barbara, Barbara, she, she knew how to love. Um, her love will last as long as y'all do. It's already outliving her. It's already outlasting her. These three abide. The greatest of these is love. And now that her absence, you're going to have to kind of make up some of the loss and love one another a little more and, and share that love a little more. She loved people in her, in her classes. We, we have had over the past, as I'm sure the other pastors and churches, some people come in that didn't know about church. They didn't know about protocol uh, and, and about things in church. And Barbara loved them and loved them in, and, and, and she showed that love to them and, and brought them in. So uh, you've got to let that love outlast her. The greatest of these is love. Now, the thing about love is you don't always have to agree to, be, to love somebody. Matter of fact, sometimes you've got to disagree to love somebody. You got to see things from a different perspective, but in the agreements and the disagreements and the understandings and the misunderstandings, you know, Barbara still loved you. Like I said, she she sometimes she said what she thought. She spoke the truth in love, and I'll be honest. Sometimes I wondered about the love part because she'd just tell you, 
She was a woman of strong conviction, and she would tell you, and a lot of times she would tell you right. And if she didn't, Rudy would come behind it and make it all right. But uh, she, she showed us how to love. She taught us how to love. And now that love that she has given, we've got to let it alone. And the thing about love, love is the heart of God, John three sixteen, For God so loved this world, he gave his only begotten son. Who would ever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so that love is God's heart. So Barbara, had, she had a, a touch or in touch with God's heart to show us that love. And my favorite, another favorite verse of mine in Ephesians 3 and 17 so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. So many times we get rooted and grounded in pastors, in denominations, in what we're doing right, what we're doing good, what we're in people and in personalities. But God said, no, no, no. To make this thing successful, you've got to be rooted and grounded in love. The strength of my serving the Lord is not what I do. It's that he loved me first. Rooted and grounded in love. And that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth. To know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That you could be full of his love. And today what I want to take away from this service about Barbara. She's taught me to be full of God's love. And to care about people. To be that teacher when people need the teaching. It, uh, we want to keep Barbara's love alive and share it every day to whoever we can. And teach others by our example like she taught by her example. So I encourage you today. Faith, hope, and love. These three abide. We don't take them in the grave with us. We don't take them to heaven with us. They abide with us forever. Let's have another song.
I think that's one thing we know about Barbara. She's going to be looking for us. As pastor of Word of Life, I want to call this congregation to a business meeting just quickly. We want to transfer membership of Barbara Pettit from Word of Life Ministries on 1023 West Georgia Road to Glory. I want to relinquish all duties and responsibilities as senior pastor to Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit and know that she's well taken care of and waiting on us to join her. All in favor say aye. All opposed no. Will you stand? Lord, I thank you that we have hope today because of Barbara's faith in you. We have hope to carry that love. I ask you, Lord, to be with each one. Be with these families, the children, the grandchildren, the great-grands, the, all the extended family the love, that love Barbara. And help us to remember all the good times we had, the words that she spoke that gave us encouragement and gave us faith. Lord, I just pray you'd be with us. Holy Spirit, comfort her. Go with each one today, I pray, until we meet again in that blessed place where there is no more tears, no more sorrow, no more goodbye. We know that waits for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd like, the family will be in the front. If you want to come up and speak to them and greet them, God bless you. Thank you so much for your showing up today. We love you.